Article 100 has the definition of effective ground fault current path. Now, this used to be defined in Article 250, but because we use it in more than just Article 250, they put it in Article 100 a couple of code cycles ago. Now, an effective ground fault current path really is the objective of Article 250. Why do we comply with Article 250? Well, mainly to create an effective ground fault current path. At the end of the day, 250.4A3 and 250.4A5, they ultimately say, look, at the end of the day, you need to look at your installation and ensure that all electrical equipment, raceways, cables, panel board, utilization equipment, disconnecting means, all of these things need to ultimately be connected to an effective ground fault current path. And look, if you screw everything else up in the entire installation, don't screw this part up. You need to have an effective ground fault current path. If you have an effective ground fault current path and, and fuses or circuit breakers, then we shouldn't be killing people from electric shock. That, that's you know, generally speaking. Look, I mean, you open up a junction box and just grab a wire, you're going to die, you know, obviously. But as far as like unintentional ground faults, energizing metal parts and killing people, we establish an, electric, an effective ground fault current path to ensure that if we have a ground fault, the circuit breaker or fuse opens quickly and removes dangerous touch or step potential from that object. All right, so here's the definition. It's an intentionally constructed low impedance path that uh, takes fault current from a ground fault back to the source in order to trigger over current devices or in an ungrounded system, a ground fault detector. All right, so the effective ground fault current path is more than just green wires. I mean, that is certainly the equipment grounding conductors and bonding jumpers, those are a big component of the effective ground fault current path, but it, it's much more broad than that. It includes things like, you know, conduit couplings, set screw connect fittings, being tightened properly. If you have loose connections and you have a ground fault, that's a high impedance path for fault current and it might not open an overcurrent device. So screws being tightened down, terminations being made correctly, using the appropriate equipment, all of these things are components of the effective ground fault current path. Let's take a look at the picture here. I've got a ground fault here. Let, let's just call this, uh, I don't know, a 240 volt uh, resistance heater, so a baseboard heater. And line B, line two, right, has a fault. So the black conductor energizes the metal parts. So let's see how the fault current path how the fault current travels back to the source. Because remember, Kirchhoff's law tells us that current leaving the power source must equal current returning to the power source. So fault current does not go to ground. Current doesn't go to ground. It goes back to the source. Uh, if it's not going back to the source, then there is no circuit and there is no current. So if current leaves the source, it returns to the source. That is that is a fact. So how does the current get back to the source? Is it done via an intentionally constructed low impedance path? That's what we need. Energizes the metal parts. Fault current travels back on the equipment grounding conductor, back through the conduit or maybe NM cable, whatever it might be, back through the green wire, back to the equipment grounding conductor terminal on the service disconnect, travels back to the utility neutral, it goes across the main bonding jumper, right, which connects the utility neutral to the metal parts. So it connects, uh, goes through the main bonding jumper, back on the utility neutral, completes the source. Now that is a very low impedance path, much less than one ohm. So if this is a 120 volt fault, and let's say the impedance path, the impedance of the ground fault current path is maybe half of an ohm, then that would mean 240 amps of current is flowing. Now is 240 amps going to trip a 20 amp breaker? Yes, very quickly. And that's what we're trying to do, right? We're trying to get the breaker or fuse to open very quickly to remove the dangerous voltage. How do you make a breaker or fuse open quickly? You do that by introducing as high amount of fault current as you possibly can. You can only do that by having a low impedance path. So current travels back on the equipment ground, back across the main bonding jumper, back through the utility neutral, back to the source, completes the circuit, 20 amp breaker sees 
200 or 2000 or potentially, you know, I mean, look, it could be as high as 100,000 or, or sometimes even more uh, amperes. So that massive amount of current is going to do what? It's going to trigger the overcurrent device, whether it's a breaker or a fuse. And again, if it's an ungrounded system or a high impedance grounded neutral system, then it would initiate ground fault detectors. But those are pretty unusual. Usually we have a grounded system, a solidly grounded system, and the effective ground fault current path is there to initiate the overcurrent device. There's another definition, not just effective ground fault current path, but ground fault current path. So you have the ground fault current path, and then you have the effective ground fault current path, and it's a subtle difference. A ground fault current path is any conductive path from a ground fault back to the voltage source. And there's an informational note here, and, and it's really important. Examples can include metal raceways, equipment grounding conductors, metal piping systems, neutral conductors, the earth itself, metal ducts, and similar. Only parts of those would be part of an effective ground fault current path. Metal raceways, equipment grounding conductors, ground dead conductors, those could all be components of an effective ground fault current path. But the earth itself, metal ducts, metal piping systems, those are not part of an effective ground fault current path because remember, an effective ground fault current path is intentionally constructed for the purpose of taking the fault current back to the source. That's why we installed green wires. The earth itself is not intentionally constructed to carry fault current back to the source. It will carry current back to the source, but our contact resistance of an electrode to the earth is so high that it wouldn't initiate an overcurrent device. You know, if you think about it, there's that magic number people talk about, 25 ohms, when they talk about ground rods. What is that really a measurement of? I mean, is that a measurement of the resistance of planet Earth? Well, obviously not, because it varies, you know, on, on from installation to installation. What are we really measuring when we measure the impedance of a ground rod? Well, we're measuring the contact surface between the rod and the dirt surrounding it. And that is just too high of an impedance to be a component of a fault current of an, of an effective ground fault current path. Remember, the earth itself has an almost immeasurably low impedance because of all the parallel paths that it has. Remember, with, with a parallel circuit, the total impedance is always less than the smallest resistor. So you've got all of these millions of parallel paths in the earth to get back to the source. So the earth itself has an infinitely low amount of impedance, but our connection to it sucks. It doesn't come with terminals. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we have to kind of establish our own terminals and we're just not good at that. We drive ground rods into the dirt and we kind of make terminals. Well, the terminal isn't very good. And unfortunately, we just don't have that great of a technology to create a wonderful terminal. A UFER, you're right, a concrete encased electrode, is a better terminal than a ground rod in, in almost every application, but it's still not good enough to be a component of the effective ground fault current path. Okay, so a ground fault current path is any path that ground fault current would take to get back to the source. The effective ground fault current path, and this is the part that's important, has low enough impedance and it's intentionally constructed to carry that fault current back to the source in a way that facilitates the operation of an overcurrent device or a ground detector. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, and ring the bell.